Now, every week at this time, we take a look at climate change, bringing you stories with big implications for our planet's future in climate critical. And we're focusing today on solar power. Now, not the stuff we're used to getting. How about solar panels which gather 10, 20, 30, even 40 times more energy than our modern conventional panels here on Earth? This is a space-based energy concept. It uses giant reflectors in orbit around our planet to take in the sun's rays, you can see there. And it points to potentially unlimited electricity and no carbon footprint. More energy from the sun hits Earth in one year than the total ever provided by fossil fuels and nuclear power. So, is this the future? Or maybe it's pie in the sky? Well, we're going to find out because with me now is Dr Sam Adlin, who's co-chair of the UK Space Energy Initiative and head of innovation at the satellite applications Catapult, which aims to capture 10% of the global space market by 2030. Sam, thank you very much for joining us. Um, I've stolen the thunder in that introduction about uh, the potential of solar in space, but I mean, just explain how much easier it would be to gather than, than the efforts going on on the ground here. That's right. So you've, you've, you've given the headline, but for a country like the UK, um, if you put your solar panels in space versus having them on the ground, you get 13 times more instant energy, and that drives the economics of a, a space-based uh, solar power solution. Because, they, they, I mean, there are no clouds, there's nothing in the way. I guess that's half the battle. And it? there's no night. And no night. So it is, it is 24 hour round the clock energy. So a huge energy uh, resource, but you have to capture it. And, and I would assume that that is the challenge that, that you're confronted with. That's right. Um, yeah. And, and so what, 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 what the solution is, is to launch satellites with large solar arrays that, that capture the, the sun's energy and then to beam that down to earth by, by microwave. And because there's a couple of really important uh, features. So one, because it's so high up, it sees the sun all the time. So you get continuous baseload energy, which is really important for, for the future functioning of the grid. And then from a cost perspective, the cost of electricity to the consumer is, is expected to be comparable with that of terrestrial solar and terrestrial wind, and much, much less than other baseload technologies like nuclear or, or, or gas with carbon capture. Right, OK, so that's taking into account the, the cost of getting something up in space. It's not going to be cheap. We, we probably appreciate that. But just, just give me an idea about these reflectors, the, the, the panels. I mean, how big are we talking? These are big structures. They're um, 1.7 kilometres across, which is an incredible engineering feat. But the important thing about space solar power 1.7 kilometres. Sorry, 1. I was 7, just taking that on board. Ex exactly. Seems, these, are, yeah. these are big structures, but the science is completely understood, which is really important compared to some other uh, potential energy solutions like, say, nu nuclear fusion. Uh, it's going to be an incredible engineering project, but UK industry is, is lined up and ready to go. Right, and um, it's not the only industry lined up and at least sort of ready to go. I mean, there, there is a bit of a, a race perhaps going on there. The Chinese, the, presumably the Americans and Russians are all interested. There is. It's very much an, an international endeavour. Uh, so there are big programmes in the US, big programmes in China. The Japanese are doing a lot on wireless power beaming. But the opportunity, I think, for international collaboration is huge. Space is always been a, uh, an arena where global collaboration has, has, has overcome some of the geopolitical tensions on the ground. And, and I think actually there's, there's a huge opportunity for partnership here. OK, so I'm, I mean, we've just been through COP26 and a huge amount of discussion about how we deal with the here and now, which leaves two big questions, really. Uh, one is, I, I mean, I didn't hear about this in the course of, of um, the Glasgow discussions, which went on for some two weeks. Um, so where is this in terms of being realised? And, and, and when might we see something like this? Yeah, I think COP was a, a huge success and lots of uh, ambition and, and, and intent. But the dialogue around future energy sources was limited. And frankly, net zero is an illusion unless we can... Uh, completely rethink some of our, our, our energy source. There's going to be 10 billion people on the planet by 2050 and all using much more electricity. You know, look at the fantastic growth in electric vehicles, for example. So it's the story of our century, isn't it? The, the move to clean energy. And we're going to need all possible clean energy sources. So, so when could this come in? I mean, that, that would be the point. Once, once things are up and running, we can produce these systems of the order of about one a year. 
the study that UK government's just released um, has a, a 10 to 15 year time frame for the first system. So we would have a, 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 a system in space delivering two gigawatts equivalent to a nuclear power station by 2040. And with political will, that could be accelerated. And just very briefly, I presume that the, the um, advances made in, in simply the cost of space launch these days is one reason why you're sitting here talking to us yeah. now. Exactly. Um, the science for this has been understood for over a century. The concept was first proposed in the 1960s, but it's that compelling need, the, the need for net zero, combined with the art of the possible now. Uh, the launch costs have dropped by nearly two orders of magnitude since the days of the Space Shuttle, and due to, launch, due to drop another two orders of magnitude from now. Maybe it's going to have to. Uh, Sam Adlin, thanks very much indeed for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.